cheese. <gasps> the F word in travel. With an HSBC Global Money account, you can drop f***s from Acapulco to Zurich. That means no f***s here. Bonjour. No f***s here. Howdy. And definitely no fees here. Pay no HSBC fees overseas with a global money account. HSBC UK. Opening up a world of opportunity. Available to HSBC UK customers with an eligible current account. Exclude some accounts such as the HSBC Basic Bank account. For mobile banking app users only. Non-HSBC fees may apply. Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection. Behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist, and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hello, and welcome to all of our wonderful listeners. Thanks so much for being with us today. Today, I have with me Amy Shannon. Amy is a literary consultant and the author of many books. She's written over 120 stories, and that includes several book series. She is also the founder of and the sole reviewer for Amy's Bookshelf Reviews. Amy, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And we are actually, I announced it today that I didn't even think about it, but this is the 10th year for Amy's Bookshelf Reviews. Oh, that is awesome. And that's <laughs> interesting because we just celebrated our 10th anniversary last October. So we have been in the business for about the same same amount of time. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that is really yeah. cool. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking that I'd like to start with, it feels like there's just so much we can talk about. So let's start with what you're most active with now. And maybe tell us a little bit about Amy's Bookshelf Reviews and how that came into being and kind of any new initiatives or well, you've now shared our, your 10-year anniversary. That's awesome. Tell us a little more about what's happening and just about Amy's Bookshelf Reviews for people that don't know about it until now. Well, in 2013, this is when people were just starting to post reviews, you know, on uh, like on Amazon. And there were some book groups and I was on Facebook and I was on LinkedIn and this author had a approached me. We were in this group and uh, I was looking for people who wanted to, who would read my books and post some reviews. And she said, oh, I write children's books. Would you mind reading some of my books and I'll read some of your books? And it's not like doing a review swap where, you know, you're getting uh, a specific rating. It's like you read it and then whatever the rating is, that's what you get. Right. So... We started doing that, and then we thought, well, let's, we should expand. And she was writing children's books for, that were specific for kids that were going through, um, that had cancer and were going through chemo and trying to, the books were just wonderfully written. And, you know, she would donate them to the children's hospital. So kids knew that there was, a, you could get past whatever you were going through, you could survive. And we were planning on expanding and trying to, you know, we started reading books from author, unknown authors, you know, and we were going, this is what we were going to start a blog together and kind of just look for authors that were unknown and kind of give them reviews and stuff like that. But she uh, called me and told me that she had, she had had cancer before, but it came back and it was full force. So she was going into hospice. And within a few weeks of hospice, she passed away. Mm -hmm. And that that just continued to motivate me because I'm like, this is such a good idea. You yeah. know, I yeah. love to read. She loved to read. So I made sure that like there was a few books of hers that I hadn't read yet. And so I read them. I got the reviews. I bought them that way. You know, whatever royalties her family could get, they were getting something. Yeah. And to honor her memory. And I... I always think about her. Her name was uh, Renee Robinson, and she was a children's author. And so I started just kind of doing what we did. I, I found a 
a small blog site and started reading books, um, not asking for requests or anything, started reading books and writing reviews and posting them. And then I think that first year I read like 154 books. And and that's a very low number for me now. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but, uh, I was told the, the blog that I was using eventually was obsolete. So they wanted me to move all my stuff to this new and improved website so i was on this uh, one of the wix sites um you know just uh you know their free plan and did the blog and all that stuff you know sometimes an author would see that i wrote a review on amazon and then they would contact me through that way and say oh i saw, saw that you read this book would you mind reading this one and i thought oh i could get asked people to do requests so i started doing that just kind of like a little social media here and there, you know, you want to request, you know, send me your book information, all that kind of stuff. In 2017, the end of 2017, I found out that there were actually uh, reviewer directories online. So I found three that after doing some research on them, they were pretty reputable. So I thought, well, what the heck, I'll list mine on there. And the first three months of 2018, I got so many requests that by June, I had to do a review freeze where I wasn't taking any requests for a while till I caught up. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> and, and it was like, I was like, where did you find me? <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of grew from there. I've reviewed for over, uh, actually, it's almost 1,800 authors since 2014. And over 500 of them keep coming back and giving me every time they have a new book coming out or when they realize, oh, I don't think you've read this one. So, you know, I I do that. And over the years, you know, I find what works and what doesn't work. I try different policies, different ways to do a review request. Um, For a while, I was doing all the work, putting in all the information. And then I switched um, not that long ago to having the authors fill out their own spreadsheet because I have this massive database of uh, Excel spreadsheets, which has every author's information on different sheets and they're alphabetized and they're put in order. And I was putting in all that information and I'm like, no, I'm going to have the authors <laughs> do it. was just it, it's too yeah. many authors. And, right. and I just didn't have, you know, if I was doing that all the time, I was, didn't have time to read or to even write my own stuff. So, right. Yeah. So is there anything over all these years of reading books and listening to audiobooks, is there anything that you could say that you've noticed that is sort of a general thing that change or anything that you've noticed? Just curious. Well, I have noticed the last couple of years there has been an increase in audiobooks. And, you know, some there's a few authors that have only published on an audiobook you know their books not in print it's on audiobook only but i have a lot of authors are going are doing print and digital you know paperback hardcover digital books and i say that because you know it could be any kind of format whether it's you know amazon or barnes and noble or, or wherever somebody would buy a digital book that they're you know they're turning their print book into an audiobook and then they think that you're like, oh, well, you already reviewed the print book. Do you review audiobooks too? And I'm like, yeah, and that's a separate review. They're like, why? And I'm like, because it's different. Because I review not just the story. I know what the story is about. But yeah. I listen to the quality of the audiobook. I listen to the narrator. And sometimes I've, I've, read, I've listened to books where the narrator just kind of didn't fit you know, their tone, it just didn't fit the story or what I thought. I'm always honest with, with my reviews. And and I let everybody know that, you know, the audiobook is something totally separate. I have an audio, I have bookshelves on my Amy's library off my website. And it. some people want their book reviews real fast. And some don't care. So, you know, when you get to it, you get to it. And then I have one for audio. And I tell them if they have one on audio, I'll listen to it, but it's it's a totally separate review. It's like it's a totally right. separate book. Right. Yeah. Way, way it is and 
that's just how it is and they don't always understand but I try to do my best to explain things or I clarify um, sometimes they have social media rumors uh, going on about oh yeah Amazon won't do this Amazon won't do that or you know there's different rumors based off authors um, you know they're I've seen hate on um, hating on other authors. I've seen, yeah, sometimes it's like they think that every author in the world is their competition. And oh. it's like, no, we are an author community. And I really found that out a few years ago because of um, something that happened to me a long time ago. In the last couple of years, I've had to have mobility aids and what I really wanted was a mobility scooter so that I could still be independent and go to the store and do things without having to have a chaperone or be driven around. And um, my son started to go fund me. And 95% of the people who donated were authors. Yeah. And I was just totally amazed. Yeah. I was like, wow. And they're like, for all that, you know, and they would send me a note too saying, Oh, I'm sorry, I could only donate this much. I'm like, You didn't have, yeah. you know, I, I yeah. was, you know, that was what it was. It was That's like beautiful. I had, you know, a couple of my friends do it, but um, my son's friends, because he started and he told them they all had to donate. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the author community, it was 95% of them donated. So I was able to get what I needed and it um yeah it it really it was like I've just felt part of that community and I've always felt that way I feel like I have like yeah. 1700 friends around the world yeah you know, because I've read yeah. their work and when you hand somebody over your work for someone else to read it can be like you know you're nail biting because you don't know how they're going to react to it if they like it if they don't like it you know yeah. that kind of stuff so it's yeah. uh, i understand that part of it and i've told authors that you know i don't give anything lower than three i think three is is fair uh you know maybe it needs some work but i always try to put a positive spin on the negative when i write a review for if it's a three you know point all of the good points out but if they send me a book and it's like I would give them a one or a two, I send it back to the author and I tell them why. And nine yeah. times out of 10, this has happened about 20 times. And mm -hmm. in 10 years, that's not that bad. That's not bad at all. <laughs> no. And I have told them the reason why I sent it back because it hadn't gone to the editor yet. It wasn't published mm -hmm. ready. Mm -hmm. When um, they're like, oh, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> uh, I don't know when it's ready to be published. So that's something I made sure that that those that word "polish ready" is like all over my review request because I have had people send me their first draft and oh, like I don't yeah. even know what that is. I will uh, I do other services and I will be a um, I've been a beta reader for publishers for authors. I have a basically I call it a network of publishers where I'm on their you know their private uh, go to reviewer list. So they you know they they will send their authors you know when they're ready to be published. They're like here's a list of reviewers. You got to contact them. They put my name on it, and I've been getting a lot of requests that way, and making really good connections with with authors i reach out or publishers i reach out to them and let them know what i'm doing and then yeah. i reviewed work for their authors and they can always send somebody my way you know yeah and yeah. they'll always get an honest review yeah now, now you brought up something that i was going to ask you about later but i'm going to ask it now because of what you were just talking about in terms of books that you get that you feel like you could really only give them a one or a two with an honest review and i i so appreciate your perspective and the the approach that you take with that. And I would love to discuss with you, get your opinion first on for the average listener or reader, uh, your thoughts on if we don't like a book, 
whether you think, you know, what are your thoughts on whether we should actually post a review at all if we don't like a book? Yeah, I, I think that you should. Now, I get requests and sometimes, but I also, I read for myself. I mean, I'm a writer. I do research. I read for entertainment. And sometimes I'll just, you know, be browsing. I have a very long I have like several wish lists that are for books to be reviewed. I'm an advocate so for anti-censorship. So mm -hmm. I purposely go through and look for books that are on the American Library Association's banned book list so I can read them and review them and share. Um, and I, you know, I, I post all stuff about that on my website as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, if you read a book and you don't like it, write a review and explain why you don't like it, but not in a way to where you are degrading the author or the, the content. Um, you know, if you don't like, say, I'm just going to throw this out there. If you don't like horror books, don't buy a horror book, read it or don't read it. Or read it and just say, I don't like this because I hate horror and I was scared or something to that effect. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you aren't comfortable with reading something and you don't like that particular genre, don't buy that particular book. Right. I've, I've been on the author side of that where I had some uh, review that started off with, this is not really my genre. And I thought, well, then why are you writing a review? <laughs> exactly. And and. <laughs> Because I'm a book reviewer, when I go, maybe I go purchase a book on Amazon, I always look and make sure the information that the author gives me is correct because I have had authors lie to me. Um, then they get banned. If I catch them in a lie, sometimes it's just an error, you know, maybe a typo or something they, or something changed or, and they didn't mean it, it came out misleading, but it wasn't. I call them on it. And if they're if they really did lie, they won't answer me back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but then they're you know, oh my god, I made a mistake. I put the wrong date down, something like that. Mm -hmm. Then you know, um, if they respond back, then you know, I, I you know, it it was an error. It wasn't an intentional lie. But some people have been put on my. I call it my no fly zone. And I also have disreputable reviewers and publishers, or just authors that are are just unkind or um, unethical. So I have what I call the no fly zone, and it's a private list that I have, and I don't share it with anybody. Yeah, let's uh, let's just take a short pause, and we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about your writing and um, and some of the other things that you are up to. Would you like to earn more from your audiobook sales? If you're an author with an audiobook, you may have noticed that royalties from Audible especially and other platforms as well are frankly kind of pathetically low, disappointingly low, and unfairly low considering what it cost you in effort and resources to create it. How is it the retailers are the ones making all the money off your work and investment? As someone who started in the audiobook industry in 1981, I've found it frustrating that authors keep getting shortchanged. The good news is that Pro Audio Voices just launched Amplify Audiobooks, a direct sale audiobook platform for authors that puts you back in the driver's seat. Earn 65% of the gross sales price that you set. Compare that to the percentage of the percentage that retailers give. Run promotions on schedule whenever you want. Create coupon codes. Build community with your customers since you'll know who they are and how to contact them. Work with a caring, responsive, supportive team to help you succeed all along the way. Get help with marketing. Get paid weekly. We're helping audiobook authors who are frustrated by painfully low royalties and the barriers that prevent them from managing their own products and customers. Amplify Audiobooks is a direct sale platform that enables authors to earn much higher royalties and have way more control. 
We're disrupting the audiobook industry by putting authors first. Get started today at proaudiovoices.app or go to proaudiovoices.com and click on the distribution amplify link. Join the movement. And we're back. So, Amy, tell us a little bit, if you would, about your own writing. I noted on your website that your stories mostly focus on the strength of women. And I would love to hear about, like, the beginning of your writing journey. And then also, I know that you've had some personal challenges that you've had to deal with and and how that may have impacted, you know, your writing. So let's start off with how you got started writing in the first place. Well, as soon as I could talk, my mother noted this to me um, that when I was about four, I was she called me her little storyteller because I would just make up stories. I'm four years old, talking up a storm. And as soon as I could write, I like to write, you know, there'd be a, maybe a page about the three bears because I didn't like the way that the three bears was told. So I wrote my own version. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since then, I was always like, I liked the short stories. And as I got older, I did um, poetry. But I was really big on like, would never lie to my, my mom, but I would always give her the long version of whatever my explanation was. <laughs> uh, you know, I always emphasize that. And I did that to my friends and stuff like that, too. Throughout high school, I wrote uh, short stories about them and their boyfriends, and they all love that. I wrote poetry. I went through a dark period where I was writing poetry. I actually read the dictionary in high school because I wanted to improve my vocabulary. Wow. It took a little while for my English teachers to realize that the way I wrote, it wasn't to like impress somebody with big words. It was just that was the way that I wrote. That was the way that I spoke. And because they're like, oh, yeah, you're just using big words. I'm like, did I use them wrong? (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, and then I had, you know, a few, um, I had some published in some poetry published in the school. We had a school magazine called Expressions where we were allowed, uh, people could contribute stories or poetry or whatever they wanted to, to the magazine. And mine was accepted. I had a few poems published in that. And throughout the years, I, you know, I was, when I had time, I would write short stories, mostly poetry. I kept notebooks. And um, even as I got married twice and I had four boys, you know, all grown men. <laughs> and, but in 2004, my second husband, his mother passed away eventually. Uh, he's the one that we're going to discuss in a little while about what happened at the end of that marriage. But when my mother in law died, my mom had died years before. She died in 97. And she was a writer. And she just wrote, so she could tell she she has something to read to us. Oh, that's sweet. You know, she thought her own stories were better than books that she could buy. You know, yeah, I mean, she yeah. bought us books and things like that and encouraged us all to read. But she wrote stories. Just uh, it was a never ending story specific for us, so she could read it to us. I actually have a few of her notebooks. I wish I had them all. But when my mother in law passed away, I was, you know, it was kind of like. That year, 2004, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. I had to undergo a couple of treatments before it went into remission. And then my mother-in-law passed away. And I was trying to, you know, you kind of reevaluate your life. And, Mm. you know, when these things happen. And I'm like, you know, I got to do something that's just for me. And, and one night I woke up and I had this dream of this story. And so the next night when the kids were in bed and my husband went to bed, I always had a, an hour or two before I went to bed just to kind of relax and, you know, unwind. So I st- started sitting at my computer and I started typing a story. I thought it would end up being a short story. In four weeks, actually, every night of December in 2004, 
I wrote a little bit in this story, and by the end of December, it was a full-length novel, first draft. Um, uh-huh. So I wrote it in four weeks. Wow. And and was that the first book that you've published? Yes, uh, Unwritten Life. That was my very first book. It was the first full-length novel that I ever wrote. And this is, I mean, this is 2004, 2005, you know, it was like, yeah. Yeah. you know, the internet was barely born. <laughs> right. Real you early know. days in indie publishing. <laughs> yeah. Very where the, you know, vanity presses, print on demand. Uh, right. Self-published, uh, you know, indie authors sound so much better than self-published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there was a lot of st- stigma back then. Oh, self-publishing. And, you know, there are people that probably should not have published their books because they can't write words anything. And those give the people who could write a bad name. And sometimes that stigma still, it's attached to us. But I sent it, uh, I sent my book out after some prodding from my friend. I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm like, it's just a story, you know, I'm like, and me, I was just excited that I got published. Uh, it was, they call it, it was like a traditional but print on demand book, you know, so if somebody bought it, they then they would print it and whatever. And that seemed okay. And then I had a couple other books published by them. But then after a while, I was like, you know, when they started having like where you could do things yourself and I kind of am a, well, I was a really big control freak. <laughs> so <laughs> I liked, I learned myself that I could create covers and because I was pretty adept at Photoshop and stuff, and I still do stuff like that now. And I'm much better than I was, you know, uh, 20 years ago. But um, I just learned that I could do it my own time. I set my own deadlines. And then as soon as I could, with those the first three books that I had published with that publisher, I wanted to get the rights back. Not only mm-hmm. because... I wanted to republish it because my first book, there were a few errors that ended up when I did the next reprint, but I did a sequel and I kind of corrected those errors in the sequel, but I really wanted to correct some of those errors that were in the first book to begin with. I, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was a mistake that just kind of, it was a good mistake because in the original book, I call this one character Mike, and then later I refer to him as Mark. <laughs> and uh-huh. I didn't, I didn't catch it. The editor didn't catch it. It was like you know, in case it was maybe they thought it was somebody else. And so when I revised it and got my rights back and reprinted it, I made Mike and Mark twins. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> and. Yep, they were identical twins, except one had a mustache and the other one did not. And see, now that's some good creative problem solving with your writing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't <laughs> like to delete. I, yeah. when I'm writing, I don't delete. When I write, I always write. If I have to have a stopping point, I always write at least what, the first line of the next chapter. Uh-huh. And then I pick up from that line when I sit down to write again. And I always make oh, sure I cool. do that. And then I don't, I, unless sometimes, you know, you just get a story block. I don't think people get writer's block. I think they get story block. So you could get like stuck in one story and you don't know where to go. But that that doesn't mean you can't write something else and then come back to it. Because I've done mm-hmm. that several times. Mm-hmm. And if I had to go back to it, then I would read it from the beginning to to the end but if i'm going on and on i just keep writing till the first draft is complete and then the second draft is when i actually go through read it make sure things connect and all that stuff i worry about all the the minor grammar and all that stuff i, I want to make sure the story connects and has closure right. or whatever it needs and i tie up all the loose ends at that way and that's right. just like kind of my process so this is 20 years ago now right Pretty much. Yeah. 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 And and so if we were then, it's so great to hear how it all began. Now, fast forward for us, were there experiences that you had along your writing journey to date that significantly impacted 
either the content of your writing or your process. Listeners, I just want to alert you before you head into the next section of this podcast episode that the following section includes some very challenging material to listen to, including descriptions of violence. And if you would like to skip ahead past that section, please jump to about 20 minutes before the end of the episode. I would say yes. In November of 2005, my husband at the time, he decided to try to kill me. So with his bare bare hands, he tried to beat me to death. And when that didn't work, he tried to choke me to death. And uh, that lasted for about 45 minutes. My kids were, I have three sons from him. I have an older son from my first husband who is still alive and he was just a jerk. <laughs> but um, my second husband, we were together for 13 years, married for five. We had just celebrated our fifth wedding anniversary. And then I found out um, he was going through a lot and I thought he was having depression. And I knew he had, he had always had a substance abuse problem. He was, you know, re recovered over the years. He had had some lapses. And when I would, those times when I would call him out on it, when I caught him, um, he went and he got help. You know, he went to the AA, he went to NA, he went to counseling and was back on the straight and narrow and it happened two or three times over the that span but this time was different it was after after his mother died he inherited a lot of money and he did not know how to handle money that much money and we had bought a home and he was spending like crazy and then he blamed it on me and i said well i told you not to do this or my opinion was to not put $30,000 into a pool. I said, I don't swim. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I said, I told you to cover it up, bury it. And yeah, it just, we, we had come to a point in our, our marriage. Um, in that August, we sat down and we really had a long discussion about whether, about what we should do if, if we should continue on. And we agreed to try to make it work. Um, in uh, the end of October of 2005, I found out that he was doing drugs again. And I told him he had to choose his family or his drugs, but he couldn't have both. So the next day I had gone out. I had a good job where I could work from home. And I was doing that a lot because I didn't know he was, when he was doing drugs, but I thought, uh, you know, when he was depressed, he couldn't really take care of our kids. So I worked from home a lot. So I would be there when they got home from school. And uh, so I had run some errands and I came home and I just started doing what I normally did. I would, I got the boys their dinner. I was making their lunch. He came up behind me, asked me what I was doing. And I, I mean, it was really obvious what I was doing. I was continuing to work. You know, I left my, my back was still turned to him, but I'm like, I'm making lunches and he called me an effing liar. And next thing I know, he grabbed me by the ponytail and basically knocked me off my feet. And it started at one point. It was a lot of his favorite thing to do was to punch me in the face with both fists. And then he would get mad when I try to um, protect myself. At one time he had a few times that I had tried to run to like lock myself in the bedroom, but he caught me. He slammed my head against the wall, and uh, I woke up. I I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I woke up to him kicking me, telling me to stop faking it. Eventually, he got tired, so he sat down in his recliner, and he grabbed me by the hair, pulled me on his lap, and he told me that I was going to die, and he was going to kill me, and he wrapped his hands around my throat, and I started to black out. And You know, they say that, like, when you're think you're dying your life flashes before your eyes well my death flashed before my eyes i was terrified that my boys who were my twins were six and my older son was hadn't turned nine yet and um i could see them finding me dead on the living room floor 
So whatever strength I had left, and I didn't think I had anything left, I catapulted myself off his chest and I ran out. I know he chased me, but I just kept running. I It was November, upstate New York, cold. I didn't have my glasses and I can't see two feet in front of me without my glasses because he had ripped them from my face. I used to smoke back then, so I had, all I had was a light t-shirt, no bra because he had grabbed my shirt so hard that he ripped my bra from my body. Um, my jeans were, were torn. My face was probably 10 times its normal size. I'm glad I had my cigarettes and my lighter in my pocket because when I was, I was hiding because I knew either he was coming out after me or he was sending his friend out after me. His friend was staying with us and he walked in in the middle and then he turned around and left. He could have called the cops. He could have done anything. He didn't do anything. He just walked away. And then when I was right that my husband did send him out to look for me. And so I was glad that I hid. Um, eventually, and five hours later, the nearest state troopers barracks, I found myself on their back steps. And I just, uh, I was about to ring the bell. And I guess I collapsed um, because next thing I know this uh, woman uh, female cop was standing over me asking me if I was okay and when I looked up at her I could just see the shocked look on her face it looked like I was wearing a Halloween mask and she called in and all these state troopers came rushing out um, they took care of me um, I told them they had to go get my kids and I, I never went uh, people always ask me, why didn't you just go to neighbors for help? I, and I was like, I wasn't going to get anybody else hurt. You know, what if they saw me go to a neighbor's house and then they tried to hurt that person? Um, I wasn't going to do that. I was not going to put un other people in danger. I knew in my heart of hearts that the one thing he would never do is he would never raise a hand to our sons. And he didn't. I just thought I would have been able to get help a lot sooner. But they caught the state troopers called the local police and they went and got my children and put them in foster care and they arrested uh, my husband at the time. It just took a long time for him to be convicted and I had to, they say you can't fight City Hall. Well, I had to fight the district attorney's office to file charges and I was able to do that with uh, help from good friends and one of my friends, her boss was a uh, a state legislator. So she got me a, a press conferences <laughs> and that got the ball rolling for him to go to prison. Clearly you have been through a kind of hell that most of us, thank God, do not have to go through. And I'm really glad <laughs> that, you know, it's, um, you know, it was, it was a hard time, but unfortunately since that day, it was November 2nd, 2005, I have had the same headache because I had six impact blows on my brain. So if, if I did a, a CT scan now, you can actually see they have these white spots, which basically are scars on my brain from what he had done. And I would always just put my, you know, I took care of my boys. And then as I got older, they were always my focus. And then as I got older, then I had to really take care of my dad. So I was like putting my stuff aside. And it's like my body said, okay, she's got to do all this other stuff. And then once I didn't have to do that, I mean, my youngest boys, they're 26. I'm their roommate now. <laughs> and my dad, I had to um, put them in a memory care facility. So I, I do oversee some of this stuff. But I have what they, I start, after I stopped having to take care of other people, I started having strange symptoms, tremors. They tested me for Parkinson's. Then I was telling them how my hands hurt all the time. And they tested me for everything under the sun they could do. And then they found out that I have not just tremors, but I have uh, rheumatoid arthritis and it is spreading. Um, so my immune system is shot, so I can't even really go see my dad anymore. Not that he knows who I am, but I send him magazines and stuff to read. But they couldn't figure out what was wrong, even with the brain trauma. And basically, my brain thinks that 
my body needs to be in pain. It's it's like it's rewired itself. It's kind of like a, you know, a computer rewired and I wish I could reboot it, but I can't. So now you have been through this I don't even know how to describe it. Hell sounds like not even nearly a strong enough word, but you have been through all of this. At what point did you find that you were able to come back to your work in the author world? Writing became, as I was going through this, I, um, before this happened, I had only, I had write, wrote three books, but I was in the process of writing a, a, a fourth one. And what I thought was really strange was one of the books that I had written and published before this happened, my main character had been kidnapped and beaten by her kidnapper, and she escaped by running through woods and hiding. And that's exactly what happened to me, but after I wrote that. Mm. Oh, wow. So I was <laughs> like, oh, wow. <laughs> and then, you know, when I was reading stuff that I had already wrote, and I wrote about stuff I had written about domestic violence before or assault on women and what I thought they would feel. And, you know... Me, I'm not a crier, and I don't like pity. Support, I don't mind, but, you know, you would, I would get those looks like, oh, you poor baby. And I'm like, don't do that to me. I'm not a poor baby. I survived, and I survived because of my children. And I, I knew I had to take care of myself in order to take care of my boys, and that's what I did. And writing, after that, it just became an outlet. And then I would read stuff that I wrote, and I'm like, oh, well, I did feel this way or, you know, so what I was writing, you know, after I, it, everything happened, you know, I was like, yeah, that's okay to feel this way because people kept telling me, oh, you should feel this way or you should be crying or I'm like, why, why do I have to cry? Or the woman, and it's funny, this is like the first scene in my fictional book, uh, Fracture Tears, which is about you know, it's about what happened to me. Um, the second half is nonfiction, but the first half of, of it is a fictional story based off of what had happened to me. And the first scene in the book was a scene that actually happened. Um, I just changed the names, but, you know, the character's name is Anna, and she was with her social worker. And it was because this, at the hospital, this woman... I don't know, it, like they have a handbook or something. She came into my room and I still couldn't see. I didn't have my glasses yet. I had some friends go to, go to my home later and have to break in to get some personal items, including my glasses, so I could see after a few days uh, because it took me a little while to get up the nerve to call people up and say, hey, hey this is what happened. And the social worker came in and she's like sitting there with a file on her on her lap and then uh, she's you know taking notes and she's like she looks at me like you know shakes her head and i'm like don't do that i said i don't even have to see the expression on your face but i could see her head shaking i said don't feel sorry for me she goes you know it's not your fault i said of course it's not my fault she goes it's not. I'm like, why do you think it is? <laughs> she's like, well, like she's looking at, it's like she was looking at this pamphlet or something that was saying, oh, like a checklist, they're going to feel sorry for the subs, they're going to blame themselves, but oh, he still loves me, they're not going to, you know, all that stuff. And I'm like, no, the first thing I, after I was able to comb all my hair out, I lost a lot of hair that day, the Next thing I did was I took my wedding rings off and I I gave them to security. And the funny part is actually after I had gone home, I realized that they were still at the hospital. So I went back and I, uh, I got them from security. And later on, I just sold them so my kids could have some food. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just like, I mean, that was like, okay, I'm not married anymore. Um so that was, you know, just what I did. I was like, my kids, I want to get my kids back. 
I had to go to family court, social services, said I was a bad mother because I ran out of the house and left them there. And I'm like, I didn't know I was going to take five hours to get help. And I knew he wouldn't hurt them. And they were so mad that the judge ruled in my favor and gave me my kids back. So it sounds like your writing was really helpful to you in your healing process. Does that sound like that's true? Yeah, it was. And some is, you know, um, writing stories. I also kept a journal, you know, writing down things that, you know, I was feeling or whatever. And it's interesting now to look back and see what I had wrote. And, you know, and I'm like, no, I kind of feel that same way now. I mean, I don't feel sorry for myself. When I think about my marriage, when it was when it was good, it was it was pretty good. I always I never when when we had bad times, they weren't like that. I never saw forever with him. I just uh, I I just figured that you know he was well he was um, I like older men so he was eighteen years older than I was so I figured he would die and that's how our marriage would end. I didn't realize that I would almost die and that's how our marriage would end. But I think that because of his attitude after things happened, it had, if it was going to end, it had to end that way. And that paved the road so that I wouldn't have to worry about him trying to take my kids away, go through all that garbage because, you know, he was in prison. And when he got out, that was one thing he wanted to do. I didn't know that, but I just had this feeling. And then he died. So my kids weren't scared anymore. My uh, one of my twins, uh, his name is William. He has um, special needs. Uh, he was autistic and bipolar, and he was a, a hard one to raise. But I raised my three sons by myself, and I did the best that I could. And I told them I would always protect them from their father, and I would protect them sometimes from themselves. So, in terms of your writing projects, is there anything that you're working on currently? No, actually, I in March I um, am releasing my very first nonfiction historical book. The past two years, or the past year and a half, just because of my hands and stuff, I've only been writing short stories. And I had wrote this book called uh, "The Forsaken," and it was the first book I ever wrote that took place in my hometown where uh mainly where i grew up and it's a just a short well it's not too short but it's uh it's a paranormal book about um a woman who i named her after my late grandmother because my grandmother passed away a couple years ago at the age of 101 and we were like best friends so i wanted to honor my grandmother so the character's name is named after her. Some of the other characters are named after her family members. They're not them. It's just I was trying to do that, you know, to honor them. And in doing the research for that, because I wanted to make sure it was basically it's this woman is trying to help her father's aide solve a, a missing persons case that happened in the 1800s. And there was only a little... A little bit of story about it and there was there's like some spirits involved and the house that they live in is in the middle of the cemetery basically the cemetery was built around it and that's kind of a it's kind of a historical thing i just made it into a house that people lived in it actually there there was a a building there um and it w was supposed to be a church but then it ended up being a meeting place for the town folk but i did a lot of research so and getting that, I got, you know, there's a point in your research where you're like, okay, I have, okay, I have enough. And then I was looking at other stuff, but I'm like, you know, this is really interesting. So I started researching the the history of the town I live in. And it was these two townships, they intersect in the small town, Balsa Spa. That's where I where I grew up mainly. I mean, we moved around a lot, but this is a place that I call home. And 
and it used to be one township and it was named after a man. His last name was Ball and it ended up calling Ball's Town. So I did a lot of research and I put it, this book together and it was just inspired be, from my research for that little short story. And it's coming out on March 21st. And I picked that date because that is the 217th anniversary of the village's incorporation. Oh, that's great. And that's great. Yeah. So I thought it was, it was, um, it's like people ask me, what, what's your favorite book? And, you know, I know my favorite characters and stuff like is, it started with Unwritten Life and, then I would write other stories, and then I kept going back to that. You know, Unwritten Life was the first one, and now it has 67 volumes, and the last volume is its finale, and like nine bonus books that I wrote. So that's where a good chunk of uh, my stories were. I kept going back to this town and my characters because I just I just love them. It's like you always love your first character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and... Yeah. But this one, it was like, because of, I love doing research. I like learning things. I'm a lifelong learner. If I want to learn something, I'll do whatever I can to get the answers. I just love to learn and I like to share what I know. That's why I help authors because, you know, maybe some of my experiences can help them. They don't have to go through all the stuff that I did to find out. I could just say, hey, here you go. This is what you could do. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I this is was my favorite because uh, I put of all the work that I put into it, and I learned so much. And I, I joke to people that this is the book that's going to make me famous in my hometown. And I'm not saying that. I mean, people know who I am in my hometown that I went to high school with, and you know, I have people that buy my books because you know, you know, they know me, and they're like, "Oh, you're this." Famous author. I'm like, yeah, I get, I, <laughs> if I sell one book, I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as we wrap up, let's, uh, I would love it if you would share with your, with our listeners some of the author services that you uh, uh, provide. So, we know that you write reviews. And what else do you do for authors as you help them? I um, will do various author promotions. I'll, uh, we'll create uh, book trailers or what I call book review trailers where I will put together a video that they can use for advertising with the book review that I have, um, you know, wrote for them. I, and I do a lot of that on Amy's Bookshelf Reviews. And I started doing more promotions on that website because that's where like the majority of my audience is. I have, that's amysbookshelfreviews.com. I promote my other work on my uh, business um, website, which is essenceenterpriseus.com. When I, I use the term literary consultant and I kind of, I don't know if that was really a thing. It was something I made up for myself because I had never, I was trying to figure out, okay, I do all this stuff, but you know, I need like one title. So I came up with literary consultant because then what an author can tell me what they need it could be they might need editing. They might just need help formatting their book. They might want me to um, do the do-it-yourself, uh, you know, indie publishing for them, you know, like on their behalf. Maybe they want me to be a beta reader or do some additional promotions. Or I have just started, it went live January 7th, and I'm just doing a, an Amy's Bookshelf Review podcast, and it's just basically talking about reviews and books and things that authors can do. So I just kind of call it, you know, uh, I say it's really about book reviews and author interviews and literary news. So it just kind of came out that way where somebody's like, what was, what's it about? And I said that, I'm like, oh, well, that that's kind of catchy. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But, yeah. you know, I do a lot for authors, so... And sometimes I just do something and it's, um, I might see something like when I post a review on Amazon and I notice that they don't have an Amazon profile page, but they have several books or they only have one book, but they're, they're writing more. So I mentioned that, you know, you should do this. Or if um, something doesn't look right on a website or their links are 
are off or their Amazon profile, like they have, you know, the, their books aren't synced up with each other. I point those things out to authors and I help them whenever I can. When I charge for services, I'll give them my estimate, but then I will work if they have a budget and a lot of authors do, especially if writing is like their second career or second job or whatever, and they're not making billions of their bestsellers, then I tell them that I will work within their budget and I never compromise quality just because they're going to pay less than maybe an author who can afford more. Well, we uh, in the author, uh, I'll just speak for authors at this moment because I think that can't imagine any dissent. Appreciate all that you're doing, Amy. Uh, this is so again for our listeners to learn more about Amy's bookshelf reviews. You go to amysbookshelfreviews.com and to learn more about what else Amy is busy doing in the author support world, go to Essence enterprisesus.com. And this is again, Amy Shannon. Uh, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at ProAudioVoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.